Hello and welcome to our home in Solihull. I'm Richard Longman, off camera, and on camera is my wife, Helen Herbert. Um, Helen was looking forward to coming to speak to Oxford Media audiences uh, next week. And so we're recording a, a little uh, portion of what she might have said to you then. Helen, will you just imagine you don't know me and just tell me a few things about yourself. So I'm Helen Abbott, I'm a professor of French at the University of Birmingham and I specialise in how French poetry is set to music. So I work a lot with French melody in particular um, and that means both analysing the poetry and the music as well as working a lot with singers. Thank you. Uh, and I think the thing that you're going to talk today about are famous composer and poet pairings. Yeah. So it's really interesting because um, when we talk about the French melody, there are a couple of really famous names that emerge, um, but each time certain poets often go with them. And um, we can't talk about French melody without talking about Debussy or Faure or sometimes Duparc as well. Um, and it's been really interesting paying attention to why those um, composers are often picking the same poet and often the same poems again and again and usually those poets are Baudelaire and Verlaine. Um, so I just think that's an interesting moment. Debussy and Baudelaire, Faure and Verlaine, they're often the pairings that sort of go together. Thank you. Obviously the, the reason that you're not in Oxford is because we find the world in such a a peculiar um, place at the moment and one of the things that I hope that I'll tease out of you is something about meaning, something yeah. about how that we connect these uh, beautiful art songs with the experiences that we're having today. So I'm going to start with one question for you. Why is it that composers turn to certain poets? So in about 1911 um, there was an opera composer called Camille Erlanger who um, wrote a piece about how certain composers uh, work with certain poets really well. And he said that Debussy and Baudelaire go together, um, but that they don't need each other. That you can have Debussy's music on its own and Baudelaire's poetry on its own. Whereas you can get Faure and Verlaine together and they are a perfect match. They complement each other, they make each other more than the sum of their parts. So that question of, you know, why do you get certain poet-composer pairings? They seem to emerge a little bit organically, but also from an, a period of time where the poet's work was really well known. Um, all of the same musicians were circulating, sharing those texts, and often sharing those texts orally. You know, I work today and I have a book, I have the complete violin here. Uh, they wouldn't have had it in this form, they'd have had it in a little a piece of paper that they've scribbled a, a poem down on or uh, just heard it and learnt it off by heart. They all trained in school, um, in, the, in the school system, um, reciting poems off by heart, so they knew them already. And that's why you get often the same poet or the same poems being set to music again and again. So Verlaine's Claire de Lune is used by Debussy and it's used by Faure and even those composers set the same poem twice. So is it uh, not so much the, the, the quality of the poem that draws composers to it, but its availability? I think it's definitely got something to do with that. Um, and I think a really good example of that in Faure's case is um, Après un rêve, one of the most famous French melody. You know, we heard it you know, recently at, at one of the royal weddings in the cello version. Um, one of the most adapted songs of all of the melody repertoire. But that poem is written by a chap called Romain Bussine, who is one of the key figures in the Société Nationale de la Musique. But basically, he was a singer, a baritone, who was good friends with Gabriel Faure, um, and Bussine translated, or semi-translated, a book of it Italian Tuscan poems uh, for his friend Faure and said, here you go, here's a poem, set that to music. So it was available because it was there, done by his mate. We don't know at what point, uh, but but what we do know is that that kind of après un rêve text is, you know, um, 
not really a poem in the way that poems are understood then. It's not got a, a fixed verse form at that point in time. Uh, it doesn't really rhyme, uh, but it's got all the sentiment you'd expect. It's about love, it's about loss, it's about um, ideal, uh, idealised versions of life. It's all of those things that you could, you know, imagine a French melody would be about. Thank you. Um, now I've played only one setting of um, Après au Rêve, but I know that you're going to talk also today about Claire de Lune, and yeah. I know that by different composers. How different might we reasonably expect different settings of the same poem to sound? Hugely. And um, one of the things I love about working as a as someone who specialises in poetry, is that I can read the same poem again and again and again and get completely different meanings out of it. And Claire de Lune is a really interesting text because it sort of seems otherworldly, of a different time. Even in the 19th century when it was written by Verlaine, it was imagining a previous century, it's imagining the 18th century. Um, and yet it's got a bunch of timeless themes to it. So it compares a woman, probably, or a lover of some description, to a beautiful countryside. It's a, you know, it's a perfect metaphor. How nice, wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to have someone describe you like that? Uh, but it also picks up on kind of music makers, these kind of minstrel makers going about town. That's not something we see a lot of uh, in uh, 21st century life, except for perhaps now in lockdown when people are performing uh, across each other's balconies or um, singing from with their windows open. Suddenly this poem for me is getting a completely different meaning precisely because we're in lockdown and we can you know, throw our patio doors open and play and sing this now and our neighbours will hear it in a way that they never had the opportunity to hear it before. So this whole idea of you know, musicians serving a community, I've got a completely different spin on the song now than I would have done uh, just a month ago. Thank you. Um, I don't su suggest that we throw our patio doors open and sing from the neighbours, but I'm going to let the cat out and then we will come back uh, with some more questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions now about Forêt's Clé de Lune, um, a piece that I've played a number of times and always conscious when I open the copy of that long introduction. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about that introduction and the vocal entry. Yeah, so as a, as a song, as a melody, it starts with this really beautiful melodic line in the right hand of the piano um, and these kind of arpeggiated, almost kind of strumming-y bits underneath that hint at the poem's descriptions of these, you know, musicians going around. One of the lines is, says that they're playing um, du lute, which can be interpreted as a, as a guitar or a lute, as, as you like. Um, but what I find quite interesting is that the poem by itself is, you know, the opening two words, direct address, your soul, votre âme. And what Faure has done is he's turned that, he's sort of mixed it in much later. It's almost like it sort of blends in. It's not, hi, your soul is like a chosen countryside, but votre âme est un paysage choisi. It's very, um, it's very kind of blended in. And something that singers often struggle with on that, um, particularly after they've kind of had this, you know, big setup by the pianist, is that they then come in and go, Votre âme est un paysage choisi, and they think, crotch it, crotch it, quaver, quaver. Um, and in fact, the line needs to be really, really gentle and subtle, and, and um, I think it's a really, it's one of the most challenging entries, I think, for a singer, um, in part because it looks so simple. Thank you. I, I'd agree, you know, uh, the other question I always uh, mean to ask you, um, is about the appearances of all these references to nature. Yeah. Um, and we can link that to what we experience today with ideas around climate breakdown and that. But what is it that Forêt and Verlaine communicate mm. to us? Mm. On the one hand, you've got this scene that is kind of idealised nature. Um, the third stanza of the poem talks about, you know, the beautiful calm um, brightness of the of the moon, which is slightly sad and beautiful, um, and there's birds in the trees. It just seems all nice and straightforward. 
But then the next word is um, sangloté, which means to weep or to cry. Uh, and I think that's a sort of an interesting interjection where, you know, the moon, the birds, there's water in there, uh, they are sad and they're crying. Um, and on the one hand, you can think, oh, well, that's just a pretty image that Verlaine's put together. And then, you know, Forhe, not really sure if he does something with that. He doesn't really dis depict it. He doesn't, he doesn't do that reflet dans l'eau that you get with some of the Debussy writing. He doesn't try and uh, capture in his piano writing, you know, the word water or the word moon. Um, but for us hearing it and perhaps performing it today, knowing everything else about the sadness that nature brings and the challenges that nature brings, I think um, there's a whole way of interpreting this now that just has a nice spin on it. That's interesting. And you mentioned the about some of the piano figurations. Mm -hmm. I'm aware, I've heard you uh, talk a number of times about imagery. Yeah. And uh, particularly in that third stanza that you were referring to, the, the fountains. Now, yeah. I would expect something quite flamboyant yeah. in the piano at that point. Uh, but what, what, why, don't, why doesn't uh, Forhe change his piano figurations there? What, what does he do instead? What Forhe, I think, is, is uh, doing in his writing here is joining the whole poem together, not going, here's an image, here's another image, here's another image, but tying the whole thing together. So um, by the time you finish the words of the poem, he restarts the melody that we hear right in the piano entry, right at the very beginning. Um, so that it becomes this whole kind of complete song. And it's probably one of the few uh, melody, uh, particularly in Farhe's repertoire, where it does that, it sort of has that hint of the cycle, that something can start again. You could almost go back to the beginning of this song. Um, and if you do that, when you go back to the beginning, you try again, you interpret the poem again, you interpret the song again, you hear it in a different light again. And that's what I quite enjoy about this Farhe and Verlaine pairing. It isn't, here's, here's an image, clear cut, off you go. But Here's an image, and each time we go around it, uh, we can get a fresh look at it. And one of the things I wanted to kind of pick up on on that as well is, particularly in this poem, which kind of puts, you know, the musicians, the joyful musicians, and the, you know, the beautiful lover or mistress, and, and then nature and the natural world with birds and, and the moon and, and fountains and water and song and music, um, is that the language that's used is not natural. By which I mean this is highly poeticized language. Uh, it is structured, it is rigid, it's in ten syllables. You know, I said for the vocal entry, you don't want to say votre âme est un paysage choisi in this kind of robotic way, which sometimes happens. But you need to be really alert that this is not natural spoken language. It's not everyday language. And I say that because when Debussy picks this up, uh, in his settings of the same poem, he goes much more for the let's try and make this language feel natural and everyday. Whereas Farhe has gone for, okay, how can we reinterpret what nature means, what uh, the human intervention is, what music's intervention is, and each time there's this kind of, you know, it's not a perfect unison between words and music, but my goodness me, you can get so many different versions of it. Thank you. I, I, I don't think that I could we'll listen to the, uh, the song or perform the song again, having heard you say those things. Um, would you recommend any, any singers that I should go and listen to um, perform this? We have um, at our disposal, particularly in the Oxford Leader festivals that they run each year, some amazing performers. Um, but I very often, when I'm working with singers, particularly in this country, I very often recommend uh, French singers to listen to. Um, not because it's anything to do with pronunciation, but it's everything to do with interpretation. And so I think there are two singers who are alive today, performing today. Some of them we've had at Oxford Leader in the past. One is Véronique Chance, or Jean, depending on whether you want to pronounce the S on her surname or not. And the other is Philippe Jarowski. And they do two completely different approaches. Jean um, is, I'm going to say prim and proper in the nicest sense of that. She is poised, she's really careful, she's really just sensitive. 
Jaworski, as is typical of his style, is much more free, uh, quite liberal with you know with meter, and you know very very flexible in his rubato. And so you get these two completely different, uh, kind of the Jaworski version, as well as being a countertenor, um, is far less reverential um, and a little bit playful. It's more on the minstrelsy side, whereas the Jean's version is much more on the stasis and the calm of the moon. And I think they're two really nice. Uh, versions of it that just give us a different flavour of the same song. That's interesting, and interesting you, that you uh, chose Véronique Jean because hers was one of the recitals I've most enjoyed in recent years, particularly uh, with a with a call out to Susan Manoff. Uh, amazing pianist, uh, amazing accomplished on that. Anyway, um, thinking about piano, uh, pianist, singer, yeah. and audience, what are your top tips mm. for those three? Um, Groups. Yeah, so for pianists, it's you know I'm I'm not going to tell pianists how to play, uh, but I am going to really encourage pianists to pay attention to where the words are going, um, because uh, just like you, the, when the singer comes in, you don't want them to go votre arme and suddenly you know plonk themselves down on top of what's happening in the piano, but you uh, you need this kind of combination which. Are, understands that once the poem starts it needs to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going forget about the stanzas and by the way it's going to come back and start again once you get to the end and just keep that momentum going it's really really important in this song and for singers the fact that there are three stanzas which each have slightly different vistas gives us um, the kind of the colours that you want to go in here but also, I really encourage singers um, to pay attention to just how much the sounds repeat in this. Um, and that means both rhyme at the ends of lines, or the ends of words, but there are a lot of very, very uh, repetitive sounds. So you get vanka and vi uh, within there. You get uh, calme, clair de lune. Um, at the start, you get choisi and charmant. Uh, you just get a lot of these sounds that are close to each other, and it's really, really exciting when you really pick them out. You sort of they sort of ping, and that's what I then would encourage an audience member to listen out to is you know almost allow the meanings to be what you want them to be. You know I've suggested some things around you know how I might think about them in twenty first century um, Britain with you know a coronavirus lockdown um, and climate emergencies and all of these things that we might not associate with this kind of type of text and song but to allow yourself as an audience member to go oh my goodness me those sounds really really just 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 sort of it's almost like they whistle or they ping it's a really really exciting poem for that particularly in this setting thank you Helen we'll come back in a minute if uh, if that's okay and we'll talk about après un rêve perfect Thanks, Helen. Um, a second song I'd like to ask you about, one that we hear an awful lot, uh, but you suggested earlier has a text of maybe a lesser quality. Um, Après un rêve, uh, in my copy, uh, clearly is a translation from Italian. What's that about? So, uh, during the rounds at this point in time, in the middle of the 19th century, sort of, um, there was an anthology of Tuscan poems um, and various people had got their hands on it, Pauline Viardo being one of them and then Romain Bussin who ended up translating this for Faure being another. And um, what Faure did when he set it, or at least when it was published, uh, is that both the French translation by Bussin and the original Tuscan Italian poem are there alongside each other. Um, so those of you who uh, might know the um, the new Peters edition of the complete um, Forhe songs uh, compiled by um, Roy Howard and Emily Kilpatrick, um, you can see what that kind of first publication involved. And it just means some of the underlay changes, as is often the case when you've got um, po uh, poems and songs that exist in translation and parallel versions. I don't know of any or many recordings that use the Italian um, text. Um, I always hear this in either the French or in a solo instrumental version. 
And yet it retains something that seems a bit Italian. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, you know, singers who, who, who take on this song, Après I have, quite often take this on quite early on in their career. Um, it's sort of one of the staples of the melody repertoire, right, you say. Um, and perhaps it's, it's unusual to be a staple for the melody repertoire because it's the most unfrench of all the melodic writing that Fauré could have done. There's tons of melisma. The end of every phrase pretty much ends up with a melisma. So um, the first kind of entry, uh, Dans un sommeil que charmé ton image, je rêvais le bonheur dans mirage. Yeah. Um, and you just get these, these, um, these kind of triplet figurations. That, that the singer is supposed to linger on. French vocal writing doesn't do that. Italian vocal writing does. So there's something in the air at this point in time where they're, they're playing around with the Italian texts or the Tuscan kind of anthologies um, and then bringing that into the music. So that's what Fahe has done there's in, the, in the vocal writing. It's much more Italianate than it is French. Uh, and put simply, French vocal writing is note per syllable. Uh, this isn't. Great, thank you. That answers my question. Another thing that I notice is that uh, reading the poem, it seems to say the same thing over and over yeah. again. Um, I, I don't, I, I, you've never corrected me on that previously, <laughs> so I think I might have said that. But what do you do with a text that is so one dimensional? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's sort of a fairly straightforward, oh my gosh, I dreamt of you, and then you were gone, uh, can I get you back? It's just, it doesn't seem to have anything particularly uh, well developed. Um, it's a lovely sentiment, it's a very universal sentiment. Um, but unlike most of the other French melodies that we, we come across in the repertoire, whether it's Forhe, whether it's Debussy, whether it's Dupac, um, this is just, just a very simple idea. And... Um, as, a, as a singer working on this, you have to really um, pay attention to what Fahé is helping you out with. And what Fahé has done is just give this um, kind of tension building. He sort of starts, you know, that opening line that, that starts low and goes up. That's basically, that is the entire direction of the song, the entire thing based on that, or oh, can I ramp it up? Because you just have to go all the way and keep that momentum going. Because if you if you let it drop, if you kind of just, just let each phrase kind of fall away, um, it sort of loses any kind of sense of, of, of meaning, really. And there is only one meaning. So if you lose any meaning, you, you kind of, you lose out. Thank you. Um, one final question then. My, my copy says uh, soprano or tenor. Yeah. We've heard it famously done by cello. Yeah. I think I hear, remember hearing it by a brass band and somewhere <laughs> in one of my nightmares, I hear it performed by a clarinet. <laughs> um, why so many voices? Does that matter? Um, Fahé is an interesting composer of all of the French um, song composers in that he actively wanted his songs to be published in different transpositions um, and for different voice types. Whereas someone like Debussy tended to write for a particular singer, Fauré isn't. He just wants to sell copies of his poems. So I have a, you know, I have a, a, a big book of, you know, volume one of his complete songs. Um, but this would have been sold um, much more. I'll just grab, um, this is the, the cello version I've got from when I used to play cello. But it's just sort of a single piece. That's how this would have circulated. It's just a sort of a single copy. And you would have been able to buy for a, a one franc or two francs um, any transposition of this. Now, the cello version didn't appear until, I think it's 1910. Um, and it appeared at the request of Fauré's publisher, who wanted to get more money out of the song, if you like. So it quickly became quite a famous song. Um, those of you who read Proust, it's something I think I ought to be doing during this lockdown. Um, Proust is totally disparaging of this song. He hates it. Um, those of you who know uh, Graham Johnson's anthology, um, A French Song Companion, uh, with Richard Stokes, know that Graham Johnson also doesn't uh, particularly uh, love this song for similar reasons to Proust. But this is a song that has had huge take up. So not just the cello version, which was, you know, done in a, a, a compilation, if you like, 
but there are some amazing jazz versions out there. A lot of jazz improvisations. There's also a Percy Granger, gorgeous piano arrangement by Percy Granger. I mean, if we wanted to fill our lockdown period with music, we could fill it with amazing arrangements of our Présent Rêve, for which, it pains me to say as a French specialist, um, it doesn't matter if we don't know the words at all, because the words are just not where it's at in this song. Thank you, Helen. I think that's, that, that's refreshingly honest. <laughs> I think um, it looks uh, like it's almost our supper time. Um, it's dark outside, uh, so we'll call it a day. Thank you ever so much for sharing those, um, those thoughts with us. Any final message? Well, just really sorry that uh, Spring Song isn't going ahead, um, but really delighted to be able to just share a few of my thoughts and um, hope we can do this again soon. Yeah.